Hello, everyone. It's me, Mitch Bach, back with another episode of the Tourpreneur Tour Business Podcast. And today, we are admittedly talking about something that, in general, people find maybe less sexy than a lot of the other topics that we have addressed on the podcast. And yet, my guests today insist that there might be nothing sexier than talking about, wait for it, risk management. I promise you, if you stay on for the rest of the podcast, we are going to do our hardest to make sure that you, the tour operator, understands not only why this concept is relevant, but how important it is covering everything from safety and health to mental well-being of your travelers. And trust me, I am not the guide for this conversation, but I have invited a luminary in this field, Dave Dennis of the Cornerstone Safety Group, to join me kind of as my co-host. Dave, are you ready to be my co-host today? Absolutely, Mitch. Let's do it. Great. Then you're going to ask all the smart questions and I'm going to go, what does that mean? As we discover this topic of risk management. And Dave has brought along two fantastic guests who approach this topic from di from very different vantage points uh, of the tour operator world. And we're going to start with Kristen Dennison to learn who you are and why you're here. Kristen, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so um, I'm the VP of Trip Experience at Trova Trip. Um, Trova Trip is a platform that connects content creators with group travel, which means we vet operators across the globe um, to deliver amazing experiences uh, for our communities. I love it. So this is a great sort of vantage point to have. You seems like it, you oversee work with a lot of different tour operators with a lot of different logistical sort of moving parts, all of which need risk management or so I'm told. Secondly, <laughs> we have we have Mike from Global Expeditions. Mike, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning. Hey, my, my name's uh, Mike Megan. Um, and as you said, I'm the executive director with Global Expeditions Group. So what we do is uh, pretty multifaceted, but it's it's with uh, with youth, uh, so teenagers, thirteen through eighteen, and then with young adults, uh, ranging through sort of gap year and study abroad type experiences. So we run a, a few uh, terrestrial programs around the world, but uh, really what we are known for and what we do best is taking students, young adults, putting them on boats where uh, the environment that we create is really uncontrived in the perspective of like leadership and teamwork and. Uh, and interpersonal skills development, and we sail all over the world. Yeah, you know, we've got a, a couple of big schooners um, that take the college kids. They're on board for like ninety days at a time, circumnavigating. Um, and uh, yeah, we teach college, college credits along the way, as long as well as uh, a lot of hard skills and sort of sailing and scuba diving and and those kind of things. An uncontrived boat of teenagers. What <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, Dave, let's start with you. Sure. Can you begin by breaking down exactly what is risk management and why should we be thinking about it? Sure. Um, let me backtrack just a moment and kind See, of- See, you've already that. taken over the hosting. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I just thought it was relevant to share how does somebody in my position who's been specializing in risk management for the past 16, 17 years get into this work? You know, my backstory started as spending four years on the ground leading adult adventure programs domestically here in North America, um, then expanded uh, out into the international context. But just by way of circumstance, started off just being the person that answers the emergency phone, working through scenarios and just tragedies that happen, both minor, you know, kind of significant minor events, but then more significant events as well, just gradually working into this space and realizing the importance that risk management has both from the field level, but also as I escalated through different uh, roles within organizations. But to your point, Mitch, absolutely. Let's talk about risk management. And I think it's really centered in the core component of duty of care. And if you haven't heard of this term before, the duty of care really speaks to our legal and moral obligations as tour operators in providing the safety and well-being and security of our travelers, whether they're students, passengers, you know, international travelers alike. The legal context speaks to the institutional aspects that we need to think about organizations, right? So what are the international or 
even our regional standards that speak to how we should be thinking about working with vendors or third-party providers. How are we enrolling and onboarding our travelers and what that process looks like and what we should be learning about them individually to make sure that we know how to respond if they have personal or pre-existing conditions or some of those other aspects as well. That's the legal component that I think a lot of insurance brokers and attorneys can speak to. But I like to rope, it, rope in the moral aspect of this as well. And to me, the moral aspect thinks to or speaks to the um, culture of the organization. Who are we? How are we supporting our staff? How are we identifying the significance that risk management has in de delivering and curating these experiences that we deliver? As you mentioned at the top here, it's not real sexy, but neither is working with an attorney, neither is gathering insurance, neither are liability waivers, but I think we all have that shared experience and knowledge of the significant roles that all those aspects play. Risk management, at least we're not as bad or unsexy as lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> My forgiveness to all the attorneys. Yeah, you know, we have a lot of lawyers at least. In so, so that's really interesting. I mean, I love, I love the different angles on this idea of simply caring for your guests in sort of all these myriad fashions. Mike, let's start with you kind of as an on the ground operator. What does that break down to practical, practically speaking in your, in your business, the way you approach it? Oh gosh. I mean, it's, it's, as Dave said, it's, you know, for risk management, it's so multifaceted. I mean, it, it really does start at the moment where you're, um, in, in your marketing, actually, um, you know, making sure that you're really forthcoming with the students about what, you know, what the experience is that you're trying to create and, and actually who the experience is appropriate for. Okay, so so it kind of starts at that level uh, where we're just trying to you know educate um, our students on on you know what they're going to be doing and and kind of underscoring I guess the uh, the fact that there are risks involved right and we like to talk about risk management of course not not about safety because at least what we're doing it is not inherently safe what all we can do is to inform uh, the travelers as to what the risks are you know so that they're fully uh, aware of that and then. Point where you know they've, they've kind of signed up for the experience, making sure that we have adequately uh, vetted our staff, trained our staff, and then we've kind of reined in um, the activities as best as we can uh, with the you know with the concept of risk management in mind, like minimizing or mitigating what those inherent risks really are. And of course, when you think about what we do, I mean, we've circumnavigated now six times with students students at the helm. You know, typically in an average year, we're probably doing around about 40,000 nautical miles, um, you know, teaching scuba diving, you know, there's a lot of risk there. So risk mitigation management is huge. Um, and then of course, being prepared for uh, any eventuality, you know, if, if, it, if it doesn't go quite so right, right? So the kind of crisis management and making sure that you've got everything in place um, should it not go to plan. So it's multifaceted, Mitch, it really is. Runs a gamut. Yeah, I like that. I like that you, I've, you start looking, you start looking at this in some of those very specific, you know, aspects of your actual business, not under the guise of this needs to be an absolutely safe uh, uh, experience because nothing is, but assessing what you can do to uh, sort of show that duty of care. Kristen, from your vantage point, what does this look like? Because it seems to me that you have a lot of moving parts and people across your marketplace. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think there's this conception that for um, for marketplace that maybe we're more hands off or we don't put safety first and we put more of the revenue first. But for us, the conversation with any operator starts with safety. We want to know how you train your guides. Do you treat your guides well? Is there a crisis management system in place? And is it a thorough crisis management system? Even things like do you have mental health training? All of that is really, really important for us when we pick our operators. We want to know that even though it's leisure travel, which a lot of people think is not as risky or dangerous, things can still happen at any time, and they do happen at any time. Um, and we have to worry about the safety of the the guides, the safety of the operator, the safety of our travelers, and then the safety of our host, which is the content creator. Um, so all of this goes into play before we even start talking about a contract or a commercial agreement. We want to know that, and to borrow Cornerstone, we want to, it's the cornerstone of everything and every decision we make, and going to the virality of it, so that we can sleep at night. Have we done our due diligence? Are we putting people 
in a safe environment. We're moving a lot of bodies across the globe. I think we ran in 29 countries last year. Um, and so that's a lot of a lot of people in a lot of places that we are responsible for. Mitch, I'd like to add in here if I can. You know, I've, I've heard different ways that both Mike and Kristen have spoken about risk management or safety in terms of their program. And I think this is a very important piece to really highlight. You know, as organizations on website or marketing materials, as Mike is speaking to, how we frame what risk management looks like or safety is significant. What does that mean? And if we're saying safety is our number one priority, if our programs are, quote, safe, I think that's misleading and it can actually open up the other end of liability where we're overstating what this actually means to our clients. So maybe then rather saying uh, it's our number one priority, programs are safe. We can speak to our programs. We lead with safety in mind. We prioritize what safety looks like, both the delivery and onboarding our students. You know, Kristen, when you had mentioned our conversation starts with safety when you're working with local operators and DMCs, I think that's a really great way to also think about leaning in towards that context, if you will, when we're engaging with our travelers. So Dave, where do you begin? This is all great. We've d jumped yeah. into the deep end. We're on. Yeah. We're working with influencers in Nicaragua. Let's <laughs> yeah. Let's let's bring it back to some of the fundamentals that that allow an operator to get started on this journey. Yeah, for sure. So the first way I like to work with Cornerstone members or anybody asking for opinion is let's first define the organizational liabilities. What can I control? What can I not control? When we think about you know, the delivery of programs, there is no such thing as a safe program. It's as safe as possible, right? So if we're operating our own scuba trips or delivering those or driving our own passengers with our own vehicles, we have that control mechanism. But we also need to recognize when we're working with DMCs or those third-party providers, the further we get away from the organization, we lose that level of control. So how are we approaching that? When we think about our travelers, they don't see the local hired transport, the rafting company, any of those outsourced services as an, um, anything different than an extension of us as a tour operator, right? So let's start with and define those organizational liability. Then I like to dive into the, pers the personal and emotional side. What as an organization owner or leader keeps me up at night, to Kristen's point? What do we do well? Where are there gaps? Where are there areas of improvement? And how I feel about that. But then also talk to our teams. Where do they feel uncertain? Where do they feel unsupported? Where do they have questions in their role as well? Because Mitch, what you and I have talked about previously is when I wear a global risk management hat, my biggest concern is the power distance between what happens on the ground and what we in HQ are issuing as policies, that top-down approach. We really need to hear what's happening from the ground level up to keep that consistency and to keep ourselves you know, above board. And then we start pulling out who owns what of this duty of care. What can we do and control organizationally? What do our field staff, our tour directors, program leaders, what do they need to know to do that role well? And how are we hiring and training them in that regard as well? But also what kind of duty of care obligation do our travelers have for their vaccinations, for the local cultures and following laws and those types of things? All right, let's break that down. That's a lot to unpack there. Yes. I, I really want to try to make this as practical as possible from the operator standpoint. So I'm interested, Mike, in the way you take this level of your relationship with your third party vendors and think about it practically. Is it in the terms of the contract? Is it your phone calls you have with them? Do you are you making sure this stuff is outlined? Do you just pay Dave the big bucks to figure it out for you? What uh, what does this third party relationship look like for you? Yeah, so I mean, we are, I guess, a little unique in in that in terms of third party vendors, um, we don't tend to use quite so much of them. Um, the activities that we that, that we do routinely, um, you know, they're all kind of actually sort of sourced within us. By by that I mean, our staff are providing the training and the experience uh, for our students. So, so there's there's limited interaction that we need to do actually with uh, you know with third party, which for places where I guess physical risk for us is a really huge consideration. Um, there's a lot more potentially on uh, you know the mental, the emotional risk, which I'm sure Dave or or Kristen might be able to talk on a little bit more because again, it's it's so multifaceted. But I wanted to comment uh, on on something that Dave brought up. 
a little earlier when he was talking about the communication regarding risk management from the operational staff to the uh, you know to the office staff or the management and, and kind of vice versa. And this is something that that we definitely found in our organization, which realistically is pretty small, uh, just in terms of the number of full time employees that we have, or even the number of student travelers that we have. But there was a little bit of a disconnect between the experience that we'd had as a company running trips for 40 years and the documentation um, of our risk management practices that could be consumed by anybody at any time, right? And and we got to a point where um, some of our operators, some of our staff on the ground, they didn't really understand that we had been thinking about these things and we had a plan, okay? And, and that was a kind of an aha moment for, for me, when some of my guys came back, actually probably meeting Dave at one of the wilderness risk management conferences and said, hey, we've been told to think about this and this and this. I'm like, where is it? I'm like, it's it's kind of, it's right here. You know, we have the experience doing it. So I think from a, from a mature tour operator's perspective, that, that was a trap that we kind of fell into um, is that we hadn't done a good enough job really putting it down on paper and making sure that it was accessible for everybody. Um, because a lot of it was just, you know, grown through the experience, the pains and the experience of doing it year after year. And then in meeting somebody like Dave, who actually kind of provides the training for this, um, I think if we were a younger organization getting paired up, you know, we would have kind of created this, you know, less organically, but more purposed. Is that, if that makes sense? That's a great comment. I'm just going to swing back to you, Dave. Have you actually noticed a desire or a need from the customers that are looking for this kind of documentation and assessments and planning, especially in this sort of post-pandemic world? Absolutely, Mitch. I think one thing that has changed over the last three years significantly, right, and going through this pandemic was when when things started turning sideways for all of us within this travel space, um, we were trying to figure things out and we didn't have answers. But our clients and our travelers were seeking how were we organizing trips? Those that were early adopters back into this space, how are you doing that when others can't do it, right? And that level of transparency, I think, just speaks so so deeply to informed consent and what does that mean to the duty of care and so forth. But as we have evolved and all travel organizations are coming back into this space, I think that level of transparency is something we need to keep front of mind. No longer can we put the genie back in the bottle and say, don't worry about our incident response protocols. Don't worry about what happens if somebody gets COVID. We need to lean in towards that and give a snapshot, an overview of what does the general process look like? Because again, that's where I think their expectations are. But I also think it builds a lot of confidence in, okay, it is safe to travel or this program feels right for me because of who I am or how I feel for or against vaccines or any of those, you know, kind of nuances that organizations are taking those decisions on themselves. So Kristen, what does this translate into in terms of your ecosystem when you look at, you have a, everybody's essentially third party and yep. yet you have kind of almost differing degrees of, I guess, intimacy or familiarity with these partners. You've got operators and then those operators have partners. What 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 goes into your thinking around um, around this issue and and such a complex machine you have? Yeah, definitely. So a few things that we like to know is one: what is your relationship with your third parties? Are you physically going to bet them? Um, how do you contract them? Is it is it a long term partnership? Is it a short term partnership? Especially if it's something that might be a little bit more dangerous, like an air balloon versus you know a a, a street cart hot dog vendor. It's varying degrees, but we want to know you have a good relationship with them and we want to know it's documented. So documentation is incredibly important for us. So if we are going into, um, we know we want to do something slightly more dangerous, like snowmobiling or something like that. We want to know about your vendor. We're going to ask you questions specifically about your vendor and what your vetting process is so that we can rest assured that you've done your due diligence. Um, and that's really, really important to us. So we always ask for documentation if it's slightly, we have a scale of what we consider dangerous. And if it kind of goes up that scale, yeah, we're going to ask more questions about it. And we want to make sure that you're writing it down. And then crisis management systems are everything. We have our own internal one, but we want to make sure you do. And it's something that's required for us. Um, we've had operators that don't have this documentation and it, it's just not a right fit for us because we want to know that if someone gets sick, you and your whole team know exactly what to do because um, that's what we're doing on our end. We're doing our crisis scenarios. We have our documentation down. 
and it's and we require that for our our partners. Mike, are you creating these scenarios as well? These kind of what ifs and how you're going to respond? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, and and kind of continuously. Um, you know, when I'm doing staff training with my guys, I always kind of reading back like it's it's a book of, of my life and and every time you write another chapter but no no specific start scenario is ever the same you know particularly in our paradigm when you've got things like the weather and the time of day and you know like all of these these things when you're out on the ocean so yes scenarios playing the scenario game is is really really important to keep everybody on their toes not just operationally but also in the office um making sure that everybody actually knows where the resources are and what to do you know how how this crisis management plan will be played out and and you know the the crisis management plan um we always put crisis actually in in, as the first word in that Uh, i like to pull that thing out whenever whenever there's anything going on because actually the sort of the flow that you you know that you develop by, by looking at this actually works for anything it doesn't have to be a crisis to pull that thing off the shelf and do a better job of managing any situation or scenario that's happening in your organization I think that's a brilliant insight. I love the idea that you bake it into your SOPs for being a business across all of the different ways you're a business instead of like, oh, the big book of naughty things that could happen that nobody ends up (laughs) looking at until it's too late. Dave, how does a company that's newer to this uh, opportunity Mm -hmm. start going down this road? Do they just sit around a table pour a beer and think of everything that could go wrong with their business and write it down. I think some of the best meetings are over beer, but that's just a personal reflection. Um, so, I mean, that's a, gr- that's a great way to learn. You know, when I talked initially around duty of care and hearing what's happening from the field or hearing the individuals within our organization and their concerns, I think is a really great starting point. I will side caveat here. Um, I think the succession planning idea is more important now than it's been in many years, right? And what I mean by that is during the recovery of this pandemic or working our way through, there was a lot of change in our workforce, both for us as organizations, but also those third-party providers as well. So maybe who we knew them to be in 2019 are not who we are now as our own organization or those third-party suppliers as well. So I'm just doubling down on what Kristen was talking about, about building those relationships. To your point in terms of running these scenarios, Um, I'm a big proponent of case studies. I think there's a lot of learning that can happen internally as organizations in that reflection, like Mike was talking about building his book, I think is a great way to go and leaning on those that have been with the organizations for a while, but also seeing what happens externally as well. Um, But I think coming together, looking at other situations that have happened in the field, talking about where do you think things went right? Where do you think there was room for improvement? How we can put some of those implementations in place is a really great way. And then building out the structure from that point. Now, obviously there's a methodical way of building a crisis response structure, but maybe that's a conversation for another time. (laughs) Not not too much sexiness in one hour. That's Uh, right, that's right. (laughs) Mike, when you are when you are thinking about, you know, all of these what ifs, as you said, and building your book, are you also thinking about your internal teams and looking at, I guess, crisis management, risk management, or maybe just the well-being of your own staff within the trips as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, again, running the gamut between the physical safety or risk management to to the emotional Um and sort of the mental health, I think, is something that, that we're all seeing um, or at least understanding is is sort of way more important than perhaps like 10 or 15 years ago when when I, you know, actually I've been doing this for 27 years, but, but definitely that has become more and more important in supporting the staff through, you know, whatever they're, they're going through. And, and uh, you know, our, our field staff for the most part are, are full-time employees of ours. Um, you know, that we're really with us for, for the onset. So a lot of what our full-time staff bring is, you know, the, the sort of the practical training of the, um, the activities that they are delivering to our clients, but that doesn't really prepare them for everything else that they need to support themselves through and our clients through, which is this sort of emotional, um, support side, which is so critical in, at least in the programs that we run for a successful outcome. You're right. There's this tendency to think of risk as I might fall off a boat. Kristen, how do you see it? It 
it's, it's a great point that might be gun to bring up. There's a it's a bigger boat of opportunity to think about how to care. Sorry, that was bad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> about how you think about caring for your team members, your travelers, uh, everybody in the ecosystem. Yeah, definitely. I think um, kind of going back, entering in travel post pandemic and, and kind of easing into it, we were so focused on illness and it was very, very much COVID, 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 COVID. How do we protect against COVID? How do we stop COVID? And then the first incident we had on the road was a mental health incident. So it really, really is much bigger than just the physical well-being. It's the mental well-being and the emotional well-being of your travelers, of your guide, of your team. I've seen, you know, summer seasons go past where at the end of it, the ops team is so completely burnt out and just exhausted. And that in impacts the trip and impacts the safety of the trip and impacts the travelers when your team is also burnt out. And so you really need to make sure that everyone in the whole ecosystem is physically, mentally, and emotionally okay to handle this. Because yeah, you're doing a lot of problem solving. Anything can happen. And having your brain switched on for potential problems all the time is exhausting. And it can really, really wear out a team. How are you thinking about that, practically speaking, in terms of, again, all of your various levels of partnerships? Are you, are you, are you making sure that there's, that there's, um, I guess mental health training or opportunities for, for for support across the entire sort of ecosystem. I don't know. I'm I can't even yeah. think like how to begin yeah. how to begin that. So I'm really interested. For our own team internally, it's a bit easier because you can see them day to day, so you can really gauge and do a pulse check for your team. I think that's incredibly important. Um, we did stress continuum training uh, with Cornerstone for our teams for leadership, so they could spot potential issues within their team to see, okay, this person looks like they're getting into a point where they're they're stressed and how can we help that? How can we fix that? Um, one thing we do uh, at our company is we do an end of season scream, which is when everyone in the company goes outside and just screams and just vents. <laughs> um, and it's actually very effective and I highly recommend it. Um, and then on the other side, on the operator side, we want to make sure there is some semblance of, are you taking care of your team emotionally and mentally? Do you treat your team well? That's really, really important to us. Do you employ your guides? Do you get a lot of return guides? Or are you really struggling to find guides? Are you paying them well? All of that's really, really important within our vetting process because a happy guide is usually a less stressed guide is, is delivering a better service and they're also okay. And that's very important to us. Great. I'd like to just take the next 10 seconds and pause to let our listeners let out a giant Trova trip scream. Yeah. <laughs> And we're back. I hope you enjoyed <laughs> that, Dave. Dave, I'm so you 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 teach people to scream <laughs> in in various ways, absolutely. <laughs> um, but I I will say, you know, in all seriousness, what makes Cornerstone unique and what I'm very proud of is not only do we provide risk management services, but we include medical services. We have a medical director that works with our members, but we also have a team of mental health therapists. Right. And what our role is in this is uh, partially on the screening and onboarding who's a pro what's an appropriate fit for a program or a trip uh, for individuals. And where are those questions? How do we need to train our field staff and even our HQ staff in terms of responding to or addressing mental health um, you know, concerns or deterioration on program? But to Kristen's point, I think it's so important. We often lean so forward into our traveler, our passenger, our student experience in terms of risk management. But I like to pull back and think of this as human safety. And our staff are so, so significant. So while we may be talking to a tour operator that works with adults and they don't see a significant role in terms of mental health support or even day providers, you know, day excursions or activities as well, I like to kind of question that or push back a little bit in terms of what is that support on the staff themselves? Because, you know, in many cases we have seasonal staff. We they work for us for a very intense period of time throughout the year, and then we send them back into their real world or whatever that next other area is. When they are with us as organizations, they are in amongst like-minded individuals. But when they go outside this circle, they go back into what other job they may have being a teacher or something other else. Um, you know, once they lose that secure bubble or that secure space, how are we continuing to support them if that feels appropriate? Kristen, you know, this concept of, of I guess, mental health or your well-being, in some ways, I see it really connecting to 
the identity of your guides, of your travelers in the way that connects to all of the various sort of cultural experiences that they're going to be thrown into. Do you like, does that come up in sort of your understanding of kind of the holistic well-being of your travelers, of your guides, of your partners, like moving throughout the world in the way they do in such, such complex ways? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, you know, when you're doing group travel, the group dynamic is very, very important and what that looks like and a healthy group dynamic is something you really need to foster. We are, we say that our goal is to, our mission is to uh, make safer, uh, travel safer and more accessible to more people and groups of, in, in different communities. So, you know, how uh, a community of BIPOC travelers is treated abroad or LGBTQ plus is treated abroad is really, really important to us. And that's something that we also work closely with our guide to make sure that we are fostering a very, very healthy group and community dynamic wherever they may be around the world. Mike, it's been three years that I've read articles telling me about the mental health crisis happening to teenagers, happening to early 20-somethings, people who have been through formative formative periods of their life where they're supposed to do a lot of growing up and socializing and figuring things out. And instead, they've um, been under a pillow with TikTok and just trying to survive. You're throwing them into positions of 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 growth and opportunity, and yet you're dealing with people that on some levels might be mentally fragile. And so I'm wondering how in this kind of post-pandemic landscape you've been thinking about this with your youth. I mean, it's huge, Mitch. It, and, you know, it really is. And and whereas I would say that maybe um, the pandemic kind of just poured a little bit of gasoline on it, uh, my personal perspective is that this has just been something that's been changing over time. Um, like I said, you know, the pandemic exacerbated it. And for us who, you know, we were, we, we managed to run our, our college programs over the course of the pandemic, but teen was shut down. And so, you know, a little bit like when you go back and see your grandmother for the first time in ages there, oh boy, haven't you grown? It's like, no, I didn't really realize it, but stopping actually running programs for a hit and then going straight back into it allowed me personally to uh, better see a difference, right? So to, to better realize that there had been this sort of fundamental shift. So it, you know, it's it's huge. And as you said, I mean, we there's nothing contrived about team, you know, teamwork or the less need for teamwork when you take students, you stick them on board a boat because the boat's only moving if the kids are doing it for themselves or we're only eating food. It's you know if they're actually doing the the cooking and and such. So it, it really highlights everything. Um, However, it's not just the students, it's our field staff too, right? And um, and so we probably over the last five, 10 years, you know, we've really been looking actually at these two demographics similarly, just in terms of the number of, you know, the amount of support that we need to give our our staff and our students uh, pre and, and, and again, actually, even in the pre-screening, uh, I think maybe Dave uh, chatted a little bit about that. That's really important, sort of matching the expectations with the reality and making sure that for anybody, whether it be a field staff or a student coming in, and that they're really ready for this. Um, and so, you know, whereas historically it was it was more on a pre-screening on a physical uh, level, right now I would say it's way more uh, focused on the mental health and making sure that emotionally this individual is prepared for this experience. And that actually goes back to what Kristen was saying about um, burnout for our staff. You know, if if we're if we're allowing um, a range of students who perhaps aren't quite ready for the experience onto the experience, that can really have a negative effect on the group process as a whole. Uh, it really can. So yeah, a lot a lot to talk about there, um, and it's it's not easy for them. I gotta say, Dave, are you diving into also the issues around youth students and? the way in which we as operators and also they themselves as travelers uh, are dealing with the sort of mental health crisis and burnout and all of that. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think it's important to shout out that never are we pretending that we are therapists. We're never diagnosing. We're never treating anything that may um, come arise or arise on our programs, right? Our role is very specifically to triage what happened and understand is somebody within a capability of us as an organization in our field staff, or is it you know, are they impacting the experience for others or are they a detriment to their own? And detriment simply means, are they creating an unsafe environment? Are they unable to make responsible decisions for their own well-being? I think is very important. 
Um, but absolutely. And I think where the challenge comes in from an adult standpoint, because when we work with students and minors, we have a lot more level of control because we're working in local parents or, you know, their local parents, if you will. But when dealing with adults, where is that line or what questions should we be asking? And for me, it's very much, do you have any um, life threatening or urgent medical conditions or mental health conditions we should be aware of? Do you have any life threatening allergies or dietary restrictions? What do you want to tell us for the betterment of your, you know, safety, well-being, duty of care while on the program? And I think there is a balance therein where we can ask open-ended questions, tell us what you think we should know, and then carry on forward. And that's how I really address, you know, the adult market in particular. How do you go about training all these different levels of guides are you uh, me as the me as the operator with a team of three and then mm-hmm. guides of i've got 10 guides what do i do am i am i holding a specific mental health kind of day of training am i just making sure that i've got things documented and accessible in a kind of way that they're always supported what what does that look like I think a combination of all of the above, you know, for me, it starts number one, what do we know about the traveler and their background to help prepare us for what we may or may not see on the ground? Number two is what are the resources? How are we designing them for our field staff? You know, I like to think in terms of steps one through three or one through four on program. So if somebody is experiencing, you know, deterioration of depression, anxiety, you know, God forbid, self-harm, something along those lines as well. What are those steps in the field that we need to do to secure to the best of our ability that situation? And then how do we elevate that within our HQ team? What other steps should we be thinking about? How do we evaluate if somebody is willing to, you know, enact a plan of action that they may have carried from home and put into, you know, place while they're traveling? When we think about journaling or you know, creating safe spaces for themselves, or maybe they need more activity in their day-to-day activity, those type of things. As long as a traveler is adhering to what they agree to in that plan of action, and our staff are feeling that this situation is within my realm of capability, then I think that's a great situation. But we also have to be clear on what are those lines, and once they're crossed, what do we then do to support the individual to get them home, you know, in as protected space as possible? Is there a type of personality of operator who goes way overboard in thinking about all of this stuff. I, I'm the opposite. I'm the underboard guy. I, 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 I don't naturally think about this stuff, but I know there's the worrier that thinks too much. How do you, how do you know when to mm-hmm. stop? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it leans a lot on leadership of the organization. So what I mean by that is Um, I often see our leaders in the field being the advocates for travelers, and I want them to hold on to that role, right? But sometimes it's a detriment to their own capability to fulfill the rest of the program. So that maybe that's one filter. Are we getting that sense that maybe it's pushing us too far in one direction or, you know, the other? Um, The other thought I have in terms of you know, maybe dismissiveness, and maybe that isn't the right term for what we're thinking about. But if maybe somebody's a little more relaxed or hasn't thought about this in the forefront, you know, oftentimes it just takes a bad or a rough situation to or experience to happen. And then that really is jarring to the system, right? So like any kind of risk management, the more we can think about prevention, general knowledge, what does this situation look like? You know, that that's a great way to lean forward to that. But again, what is that criteria where it disrupts the organization or it disrupts the group and takes away from their experience? Or is somebody not able to make their responsible decisions for themselves or pretty much the general guidelines that we use? And there's a lot of nuances and gray area for every situation. Mike, how do you balance that? You're creating experiences that are designed to push somebody to the edge uh, metaphorically in a safe way, but knowing the, where, do you, where, do you, where do you know when to stop? It's it's very very hard, right? And um, I think it takes it takes an honest conversation really between the field staff and the office team or the management, um, and and not necessarily like the people playing those two roles, but somebody who's like deep in the weeds, right? They're like in you know they can't see the forest for the trees because they are um, you know with this student on the ground. And and as you said, Mitch, our programs are designed to be a safe space, right? They're designed to push people um, outside of their their comfort zone, um, so to speak. And so I would say that we 
you know, we get some disclosure. Um, you know, we create this place where students feel like that it's it's okay for them to disclose and let that guard down. And that's great to a point. And to your point, at the point where it is, uh, you know, they're either disclosing something that, that puts them outside of our essential eligibility. That's a term that hasn't come up yet, but is is really, really important for our, our travelers to know um, what the, you know, what the eligible, what, what they really have to measure up to in order to be eligible to be on our trip. And then for, for our field staff to, to actually let go when it's time to let go, you know, say, okay, you know, this either, either isn't a safe space. You know, we, we, we cut, we don't have the resources on the program to maybe offer this student or this traveler with what they're going through. Um, as much as you would like for this to be a successful experience for that student or travel, right? And that can be very difficult when you're 55 days into a 90 day program, because there are some very, very strong bonds that have formed at that point. It's difficult. It's difficult. Kristen, I imagine it's not easier for you. You have a lot of different personalities who are in some ways the, the, the crux of the experience in terms of their mm -hmm. influence, pardon the pun, but you work with so many people that are outside of, you know, the, the, the tight ecosystem of a team of people deciding how far to push mm -hmm. people. Where, where, how do you approach this? Yeah, we're really, really big on making sure everyone who goes into the situation knows how to set up appropriate emotional boundaries. Um, just because, you know, the host or the content creator or even people on the ground you know, it's very, very easy to overly bond and then you become too attached. And then it's very, very hard to then make a decision that maybe this person shouldn't be on this trip or maybe this isn't the right experience for them because you're already so far in it. So it's very important to us that we have, you know, before anyone goes on a trip, specifically our host, we say, all right, this is how you set an appropriate emotional boundary. This is what normal beha or expected behavior from your traveler should be. Please, you know, make sure you keep yourself safe mentally and emotionally as well. And that's a really big part of it. So, you know, having people know what they're getting into before they go into a group trip where it can become so intimate and so close and making sure that's kind of spoken about before they actually go is a huge, huge, um, to, you know, method that we use and employ and train hosts on. Um, same with guides. Guides, it's very easy when something goes wrong that you get burnt or you become either too attached or overwhelmed in whatever scenario occurs. And it's important to us that our guides also know how to set those boundaries so that they can stay safe and they can go home and go to bed and not, you know, be so far in it that it's hard to get out of it and they become overly risk adverse because of one bad situation that occurred. You know, one point that I want to really, I guess, emphasize is that this is all designed to create the conditions for really powerful transformation of people that that these are the guardrails that create the conditions of something truly spectacular i'm wondering if maybe i don't know just to keep it positive and remind yeah. people that this is about uh, you know unforgettable incredible transformative experiences if yes. either of you could share um an experience or something great that's happened on a trip i know i'm putting you on the spot but Kristen, looking through trove of trips just trove of trips you have a lot of um uh experiences that look like they're very meaningful for the travelers yeah definitely and it's it's one of those things where i still read every piece of feedback that we get that comes through because reading the stories of people who become i mean we're a new company so we've only been operating really heavily for the last year but seeing that there's friendships and people going on the trips over and over and over again we have hosts saying that this is their favorite way to make revenue because they get to connect with their community offline and take that away from Instagram comments. I mean, that's amazing. And then just the crazy wacky trips we've, we've been able to run. We did a roller skating trip in Costa Rica where they rented out, like, I think it was a mall gymnasium and they all went roller skating. And we just had a disc golf trip in Cambodia um, where they, which I didn't even know disc golf was big in Cambodia, but there you go. And <laughs> it's it just really, really cool to see those things come to life, especially after two years of pandemic where everyone was so online and taking these connections that were made online and putting them in real life has been the thrill of my career. Mike, have you ever had a good experience on any of your trips? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God. So, um, 
so I, I think I mentioned it earlier, like the woods from the trees, right? And um, and so when we have our, our students go back through their re-entry process, having had such a, hopefully a formative experience, um, you know, there's like layers to this experience that as they kind of like unfold the rest of their lives, um, we hear it time and time again where, you know, there's just like that aha moment, right? Which hopefully we've all had in our lives where something that we picked up along the way you know, we, we, we listened to it, we maybe didn't understand it contextually, and then all of a sudden something happens and it falls into place like a little puzzle piece. And you're like, wow, you know, had I not have had that experience, this wouldn't have made sense. So we like to think that a lot of our students walk away with, you know, with a lot of tools that they haven't discovered yet. Um, and, and in fact, part of our re-entry is we, you know, we send uh, a document to our students to say, you don't understand this yet, but like, Here's some ideas about how you can actually articulate what this experience is on a resume, you know, or, or whether it be a like college essay or resume, because it's it's it sort of lives in that limbic part of the brain, right? It's, it exists, but you don't really know how to articulate it. So we are lucky enough now to start having grandchildren of former students come on the program. Um, and so, you know, it was pretty exciting when we started having kids, you know, but now you're starting to have like grandchildren. And that, you know, to, to hear those stories is just like mind blowing when people are saying, okay, you know, this was a formative experience in my life. I want it for my son, daughter, you know, grandchild or, or, or whatever, you know, it sounds very contrite, but you hear a lot that like, it changed my life, you know, change your life. Maybe it did just help you understand more about who you were and what you wanted to get out of your life, what was important. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of very, very cool stories. Mitch, if I can jump in here, I think um, what you're pointing to, and I really appreciate you bringing it back to the experience and, and the transformation, you know, that we all deliver. I think about risk in two buckets, actual and perceived risk. When I think about the traveler themselves, right? The actual risk is, are we acting negligently as an organization? Are we not vetting our suppliers? Are we not training our staff appropriately and so forth? versus the perceived with risk or controlled risk where we're setting up guardrails and boundaries that we as an organization feel comfortable working within. With our travelers, it's a new experience. We wanna push those boundaries and that's where the magic happens. Uh, so again, thanks for shouting that out. And I do believe that there is freedom within planning. I am a get to yes guy whenever possible. And I think by planning, building structure, have appropriate training, we can have freedom in what we're offering, but we can also get to that yes moment where I get a little worried or start advocating that we need to rethink what's happening is are the activities, are the destinations intentional? Are we filling in a gap in a program and just throwing in a high risk activity or something that may jeopardize human safety and, and security, or is it meaningful, impactful and drives to the experience? If so, then how do we set those guardrails so we can get to yes? I want to, close by thank you for that that's i think a really powerful way to frame it that we're creating sure those guardrails and everything and thinking about risks but ultimately it's to create an intentionality around everything that we do in the trips that we design um i just wanted to close with going around and asking for each of your recommendations to the people out there that are just starting to go down this journey or are doing it in kind of a confused or unintentional way. Mike, what 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 recommendations do you have as people go down this journey from your experience? I would say that if you if you're sort of new to it and you know you you haven't had the experience or you haven't worked in an organization that maybe has that framework, um I would I would suggest that what you try to do is to align yourself with perhaps an association. Um, if there is one that has, you know, specific guidelines or some kind of accreditation, uh, cause those guys, they're going to come up with, you know, a, a, a lot of bullet points. They have you thought about this, have you thought about this? And it, it's pretty scary initially when you do that to just see it all laid out for you. Um, but it's such a great starting point. Um, if you don't have a, if you don't have an association, uh, like that, um, sort of Cornerstone or a similar organization can help you get to that place. I think for all of us as educators, which is really what we are, like the most important thing is to get people, you know, talking about the um, 
sort of the matrix of, of well, you don't know what you don't know to, to the point where you know what you know. We've got to get people out of that space where you don't know what you don't know. Even when it's scary, getting into that place where you suddenly realize the amount um, of information that perhaps you have to consume or create to to get to that that place. So an association or um, maybe an organization such as Cornerstone. Kristen, what's your your advice? Yeah, definitely. I, I would probably echo a lot of that. You know, you should, if you don't know what to do or where to start, hire a consultant, hire someone who will help you build that framework. The other thing is the travel industry as a whole is so kind and open. And I've never gone to someone in, in the industry and asked for advice and did not either have someone point me in the right direction, give me advice, tell me about their experience. And like that has always helped me in my career. It's a very, very open, warm, welcoming industry where people do want to help each other. Um, even as much as when someone applies to be an operator at Trova Trip and maybe it's not the right fit, we will tell them what they need to do to become the right fit, whether that is build out a CMS, up increase your insurance. This is what we recommend for vetting. And yeah, I, I just find the industry itself very helpful in that field. But if you really don't know where to start, hire a consultant. <laughs> this doesn't strike me as the thing you figure out on your own in any sort of helpful <laughs> way um, yeah. beyond just kind of a grab bag approach. Dave, um, can you tell me just to conclude about the resources that Cornerstone offers and, you know, give me, give me the background of why you really have a passion for doing this, this dirty work. I, I appreciate that, Mitch. Um, so what we do at Cornerstone is, uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, we provide risk management, medical, and mental health services. And what that means to us is we have members that come on, tour operators, program providers, purchase a 12-month membership, and gives access to all of our resources that we customize based on every organization's need. So when you were asking about where do people start, that's where we dive in as well. What do you do well? What makes you uncertain? What keeps you up at night? Where do you think there are gaps? And then let's game plan what the next period of time, you know, 12 months, six months, three months, what that might look like. Well, one core area um, of our membership or two core areas. Number one, we have a resource library. So if somebody's trying to figure out documents and planning around incident, crisis response, health screening, any of those things, we have it um, already there, which I think is great. And that just builds this best in class kind of approach. The other is we offer on-call services for our members. So if they're through the training and, and situations arise and get to a certain critical level and owners or leadership uh, don't know where to turn, that's where we step in and bring in our full team or individual aspects of all of those uh, aspects as well come into play. How I got into this work and really my passion story is what gets me up every day. I absolutely love this work as mundane as it may seem to some people, but it really came from an experience where I am very passionate about travel and been doing this in this space for 27 years within the industry. But I was the person that was in front of a family that lost a 22 year old because the company I worked for had a rollover vehicle accident and they died on our clock for better lack of framing, right? I've unfortunately had other scenarios and situations like that. And every time I'm just reminded of how powerful and transformative our experiences are, but how much risk they actually carry in that regard. And I really set it out on my own personal mission to correct what I saw was maybe some gaps or misalignment in providing these transformational experiences in an unsafe manner. Uh, and I've had multiple reflection times where I've had to deal with these types of situations and it keeps reminding me how strong we are as an industry, how much we can rely on each other to the point that Mike and Kristen made in and around our community. And I'm a firm believer that there's no such thing as intellectual property when we are safeguarding human lives. And that's really the work that I get up every day uh, and take pride in doing. Fantastic. I think over the course of this hour, we did something even better than making risk management sexy. I think we made it the condition of transformational experiences, which is maybe even more sexy. And so Dave, Mike, Kristen, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your experience for the tourpreneur community today.